What up, though? Welcome back to World Heavyweights Live on WorldSports.com. I'm easy joined by Spin More Rex. Hello. Young Chris Nicholas Koloff, Caleb the Colorblind. We'll be joined by Derek Klassen from The Athletic. What's up, man? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Great, great. Good, man. Appreciate you joining us. And Nate Sudfield's off my team. Yeah, he's I'm, not, I'm, he's I'm, not on the team. I'm anymore. flying high right now, brother. Let me tell you. <laughs> is that is that the highlight of the of the 53? The, I think the 53 so. Day? Ki- kind okay. of, yes. <laughs> oh, oh any, any surprising cuts for you today? I guess that you've seen around the league. Um, I, I've actually kind of been stuck like in podcasts and, and the meetings and stuff. So I've actually missed a lot of 53 cut down day. I'm going to get to that this evening, but. Um, Sudfeld's a funny one. Do you remember when Eagles fans were just convinced that they were going to trade him for like a second round pick yes. or something crazy? Yes. yes. What a world. Yeah. The, 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 the NFC East fans are just, they're all over the place. I'm being quite honest with you. Um, we had one great backup. Every backup we have now is going to be the best guy <laughs> yeah. ever. Like, something I did want to ask was there, there was a couple wide receivers cut that were pretty decent names out there. You know, guys, Noah Brown. Terrence Marshall Jr., Martavis Bryant, Tim Patrick, and the Lions Don't on just their throw Martavis Bryant. I do. I, I, lo- I like Martavis <laughs> Bryant. <laughs> 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 like you said, I have a I have a heart for fantasy guys. Dude got me eight touchdowns one year. I'm right. cool with it. But the Lions on their initial 53, which was 52 technically, only had four receivers, and, and they cut Donovan Peoples Jones. They cut Caden Davis. Which one of those guys would you see being the best fit for this roster? Probably Tim Patrick, because, you know, this has been a team where we've been really hoping that they could go out and get just a big bodied X receiver. And Patrick, it's really just a matter of if he can be healthy, because I think when he's healthy, he's a guy who you can kind of just put him outside the numbers. He's going to go win jump balls. He's going to be useful in the red zone. It's just a matter of is he going to be able to stay on the field? He's probably their best bet to replace a guy like Donovan Peoples Jones and give you a little bit of of size in a receiver room that doesn't have a ton of strength or a ton of size. Uh, you know, Eamon, Ron, Eamon Ross St. Brown is a little bit on the smaller side. Jameson Williams is a pretty slight guy. Uh, even Laporta from your tight end position isn't like as bulky as a, a traditional tight end. So it may be a guy like Tim Patrick is, is their best bet. That's what I'm looking forward to. I want somebody with that. I mean, we could try a, pl- a true X, you know, just come off the line. You know, if it's a red zone situation, maybe just even outside the numbers. That's what I was looking at, too. How about Noah Brown? That's, that's been a guy I've been keeping my eye on if we don't get a Tim Patrick or there's injury concerns. Can Noah Brown fit that X spot? I don't know about the X spot, but I will say he's great insurance for a guy like Eamon Ross St. Brown because he'll actually do a lot of the dirty work over the middle that, that St. Brown does. Obviously, he's not as explosive with the ball in his hands, but he's a guy who's willing to go dig out a safety if he has to in the run game or, or catch some of those passes in traffic over the middle. So if they are really just looking for a little bit more of like an insurance guy, I think that's actually a, a good bet for them to make. And another a surprise cut in the NFC North was Lewis Seen of the, of the Minnesota Vikings, a guy who they drafted high, a guy who they got in return for trading the Lions the pick, which we made to grab Jameson, Jameson Williams. Williams. Well, what's going on with Minnesota right now? Like, are they just falling apart? I don't think they've drafted well at really any point in the uh, Quasi era. Uh, And, you know, recently, I think, especially this last year, people are going to point to like, well, J.J. McCarthy seemed really promising. And Dallas Turner, I think, was a really good pick. I think both of those things are true. But also, they basically did like the Herschel Walker trade to go get those guys. Like, they gave up a ton of assets to go get two players. And a lot of their other picks really haven't worked out the past couple of years. You know, I've had me and both uh, Robert Mays have had people in our mentions being like, well, you know, Jalen Naylor was drafted and he's going to contribute for them. But like, we don't know if he's a good player yet. Like, that doesn't mean anything. So um, I-, I think drafting for them has been tough. I think they've done OK in the free agency department. And obviously, you know, trading for Hawkinson was solid and, and they've got some stars. But the the meat and bones of the roster is is, is tough to find. Speaking of the meat of bones, the meat of bones of this NFC North have been, and I wish it was Detroit Lions, and that was the end of the conversation. However, the Green Bay Packers are on a little bit of a rise. Uh, I'll give the Bears their due credit. I, I do dislike them the most of everybody else in the NFC North, but they, they got something going on there. Who is the biggest threat to my Detroit Lions right now in this NFC North? I think it has to be the Packers. I mean, if everything goes right for this offense, I mean, even if not everything goes right for this offense, it's probably a top 10 unit, which we saw last year. You know, they struggled for kind of the first half and offensive line kind of had some guys in and out. And by the end, they still figured it out because I think 
to me, Matt LaFleur is one of the best head coaches in the league. So I would be very scared of the offense. It's more just a matter of is the defense, is this finally the year after, you know, four years of people saying, oh, the Packers defense, surely they'll be better this year. It's basically just a matter of is this the year or not? I think if the defense does get to at least average, maybe slightly above, they can win 13 games. And I don't think that's crazy. It's just I don't know if we're going to get that. So I would say to me, it's like the Lions and the Packers are kind of in a tier of their own. The Bears are frisky. And then the Vikings, they might be fun, but I don't know if they're going to be good. And and looking at other teams, other teams who are supposed to compete for the NFC, like the uh, Dallas Cowboys. You look at what the Lions did in the offseason. You know, they signed Amon Ross St. Brown. They signed Penny Sewell. They signed Jared Goff to these big contracts. The Cowboys, it took them until the last week of the preseason to get a guy who is arguably the best receiver in football. I don't think he is, but you could put him in conversations for top three. And they still haven't signed Dak. Like, well, what's going on in Dallas? Jerry just does this, man. Like, I don't know what his whole deal is, but Jerry just loves to string out these deals until the last possible second. I, I don't know if he thinks it gives the organization some sort of mental edge or what it is really. But, like, you know, again, I was even talking to Robert about this. There was no mystique as to whether they were going to sign cd lamb right it was going to happen it was just a matter of when and for how much money whereas at least with the iu situation it, it is kind of up in the air and there's a are they going to trade him are they going to pay him that was never the case with lamb it was just jerry jones and the cowboys waiting forever for whatever reason so i don't know this, this dallas team it feels like they brought back a lot of the band from last year but they're like 5% like the ceiling is just a tad lower it feels like they lost a couple of guys especially off the edge so Still a good team, but the vibes are a little bit weird. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, too, didn't they only beat, like, two teams above 500 last year, and, and we were one, and it was, like, I'm one of the sketchiest wins I've ever witnessed in my life as a, as a football fan. Like, I almost categorize them as pretenders, and now they have a, a first-place schedule this year. I don't even know. I'm, like, I when people are calling them contenders, it, it kind of blows my mind. I don't really see them as that. They have no answer to the running back position. Are, do you expect them to make the playoffs at all this year? Or am I just being a hater? No, I think I think the pretenders thing is fair. I, I think, though, when you have Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb, that alone is going to get you above average offense. And I actually kind of think the offensive line is going to be fine, even with some of the changes and some of the rookies they're bringing in, um, even though losing Tyron Smith is, is obviously going to be a big problem for them. To me, it really comes down to the defense. This was a defense that played well for a lot of last year. But obviously, as we saw towards the end, they kind of started to fall off. And then any offense with a pulse was able to kind of just shred them because they were doing a lot of very simple stuff and, and playing in a chaotic way. I do think bringing in Mike Zimmer, who is much more of a controlled, you know, everybody's going to actually do their job. We're not going to be shooting gaps randomly and just doing stuff for fun. I, I do think him kind of buttoning up the defense could go a long way for them. It's just I think it's also kind of counterbalanced by them losing some talent. So it's kind of just a matter of which of those two factors wins out. We got our big money draft this this uh, tonight, actually. Rico Dowdle, is that is that... Are you taking any late round flyers to that guy, or like, what, what are they doing at running back? This is crazy. I, he's one of those guys where it seems Dallas Cowboys fans love him, and I just I don't really understand it. I think he, they brought back Zeke for a reason, knowing that Dowdle is probably not a guy who's going to take a ton of carries, um, and Zeke is probably going to get more of the passing game volume than I think people realize. He caught like fifty passes last year or something. Uh, it was a lot more than people think. So. Wow. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get a lot of Rico Dowdle this year. And looking at uh, a team in the AFC that they are kind of my my AFC team, if that's you know legal for me to say, <laughs> uh, the Houston Texans. I, I called them last year worst to first, even before the draft. I, I said they were going to be the worst to first team. They did that. I am all in. I got C.J. Stroud in two different leagues. I got Nico Collins in a league. I think C.J. Stroud is going to be the MVP this year. How I think the Lions are going to beat the Texans in the Super Bowl. Like, how, how much realistic is my expectations for this Texans team to just take another step under the second-year quarterback and head coach? I don't think it's crazy at all. You know, to me in the AFC, the Chiefs are kind of in their own category, and I think everybody would be fine saying that. And then to me, I'm still a big on the Ravens. I think they're going to be a really good team. And then after that, it's probably the Texans. And I think you can even make an argument that if a lot of things go right for Houston, whether it's the defense playing it closer to a top 10 level, um, like they showed, you know, some spurts of last year, or it's the offensive line is healthier and takes another step. And CJ Stroud takes another step and the offense takes another step. 
if some things go right for them, they really could be the team that is contesting Kansas City for the top spot in the AFC. So I don't think it's crazy at all. You know, CJ Stroud, it seems every time a rookie has an insane year like this, there is some portion of people that are like, oh, well, is it really real? Dude, you watch CJ Stroud. He's making big boy throws every single drive like just yeah. absolutely down the field tight window in muddy pockets that dude is so legit it's it's not fake at all yeah i like watching see this job play football he's pretty pretty fucking good <laughs> uh <laughs> i want to reel it back into the uh, nfc north here i don't know how we ended up in texas there but how how real is jordan love speaking of young quarterbacks who kind of just exploded last year is is that legit like should we be concerned for the future or you think he, there's a possibility, like, there's some tape on him now. Maybe there's a little bit of a, I guess you can't call it a sophomore slump because he's been in the league for a while. But, I don't know, I guess a fall back there. I'm pretty bought in on, on Jordan Love. You know, I think it seems people kind of frame it as he only played well in the second half of the year. And obviously, production-wise, that is very true. But I think if you watch him in the first half of the year, you can see a guy who is trying to manage the pocket, who is trying to play on time, who is trying to make these tight window throws that a lot of the best quarterbacks in the league will make. It's just that between some of his own inexperience, some of his accuracy issues he had early on, some of obviously the chemistry problems he was having with a bunch of young receivers, like there was no veteran to go help him. I think there was just a lot of inconsistency with the offense. It seemed like once he settled in a little bit and his pocket comfort got a little bit better, and then the chemistry with all his receivers by week 10, by week 12 got better. He really locked into being a very good player. So uh, I don't know how, you know, CJ Stroud is probably a little bit better, but I think they're kind of neck and neck. I think both those dudes are awesome. And then I, just one other quarterback in our division I'm kind of coping about is the Caleb Williams hype train. I, I saw it. I get it. I've never doubted it for a moment. But then the other day I was thinking, just watching that play he had, I think it was against the Bengals the first half. It feels like he has to just run around and do all these pirouettes around the field to, to find, like, a, a throwing lane. Do you think he survives a 17-game season, like, playing that way? Or you think they'll lock it down at some point? I think the more we get through the season, he'll cut some of that stuff out a little bit. But I think he probably is always going to be a guy who wants to look for that stuff. And I think, truthfully, he'll probably be fine in terms of, you know, taking hits and, and protecting his body. Because I think... Even for as chaotic as he can play, he actually does do a good job of getting out of bounds when he needs to. And his balance and his management of really tight spaces is good. So you don't actually see him take that many crazy hits, um, even in college. So I actually think he's going to be fine playing this way. It's kind of just a matter of how many of those crazy throws, once he gets outside the pocket, is he willing to make and how many can he connect on? I think that's kind of more of the bigger thing. It's really just like... Is he going to throw 10 interceptions or is he going to get closer to 16, 18, 20, something like that? And a thing I think that is the biggest factor in the NFC North, more than Jordan Love, more than Caleb Williams, more than any of these, is this revamped Lions defense. Because, you know, they are the reigning yeah. kings of the North. They were a decent secondary away from playing in the Super Bowl last year. They had a top two rush defense. And they added these pieces along with moving – Brian Branch to full-time safety position, which I think is going to end up making them a top 10 defense in the NFL. Because if you gave them a middle of the pack secondary last year, they would have been a top 10 defense. So yes, he has them top 10. Is that you do have them top? I was gonna say, yeah. is that crazy or, or what do we? No, you're speaking my language, man. You know, yeah. we did our top 10 defenses show maybe a couple weeks ago, and and the Lions were one of my you could call it a surprise pick but i think you're on the right you know line of thinking there where the front especially the front four in the pass rush they were playing at a high level it was just a matter of can we get some bodies in the secondary for aaron glenn and he's obviously he's a really good coach and he can get the most out of guys but when you're asking you know the 40th best corner in the league to to be a plus player for you that's really hard now they brought in a guy like carlton davis who i love and think is fantastic he can be a true one Terry and Arnold, I think they drafted a guy who can also be a number one corner. And this rake straw, I think, is promising. They even bring in Amik Robertson, who has shown really good play out of the nickel. Um, and then, like you said, if Robertson is good in the nickel and, and they don't have to worry so much about playing Branch there and Branch can just be unlocked as a safety, you're fixing two spots now. Like, it's just yeah. they've they've added so many bodies there uh, and they have now they have high end guys and they have good depth. So I think this secondary is going to be awesome. And a thing that we've been doing is putting up awards races for potential players uh, on this Lions team. Drafts. And the one that seems to keep winning out over any other position, over Offensive Player of the Year, over MVP, anything like that, 
is Aiden Hutchinson's potential to be defensive player of the year this year. And you look at adding a DJ reader on the inside who was instrumental to, you know, Trey Hendrickson getting a 17 sack season. DJ Watt. Is it, is it true? Is, is the Aiden Hutchinson hype? Like are, I said 17 and a half sacks this year. That's, that's what I think he can reach. Is, is that too crazy? Or is that it's like an MC East fan? Is that no, good? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think it's crazy at all. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, like you guys mentioned, bringing in DJ reader, I think, is going to help free up some space over the middle and and that should help Hutchinson get some one-on-ones and really just have more space whenever they do picks and games and stuff like that the secondary being better where you're not just going to get the ball out in two and a half seconds on a lot of plays because the guys can actually hold up and give him some time the other thing is it's not like this Lions team has a lot of other guys who are going to finish the sacks they're going to have to be Aiden Hutchinson so if he can really play at maybe a, just like a half level above what he was last year. And then the secondary is as good as we think it is. He, I don't think, you know, a sack a game is really out of, out of the realm of possibilities here. Let's get it, man. Uh, Mike Sandel put out his uh, quarterback tiers today. And uh, our guy, JG, fell 10. I know you and I kind of share some uh, – Observations of Jared Goff. <laughs> uh, just walking on, walking on glass over here oh, with dude, the they chat. They go Detroit, after dude. him, man. But Derek and I, because I, I listened to your guys' show today. They did a great piece in Detroit Lions. Make sure you go check that out. The Athletic Football Show. I heard you use the word Super Bowl today. Was did you did you mean that Detroit Lions Super Bowl? I, I truly mean that. I think they would Let's probably go. be my pick out of the NFC. And I think it's, you know, probably to me, it's going to be them, the Niners or the Packers. Like one of those three, I would be pretty surprised if it's not one of those three teams. Um, but yeah, the Lions just feel like they brought so much of what was a great offense back this year, um, whether it's the offensive coordinator, a quarterback who is, who is, you know, I know we, I've had my reservations and you do too, but he's at least an above average guy. And I think in that, you know, 10, 12 range. So he's, he's a good player. The offensive line, a lot of guys, even the ones they replaced are good players that they brought back in. So I think that's not going to be a problem. You obviously still have your best receiver and then the defense, if they, you know, even get to above average, which they weren't last year, I don't see why this team can't make the Super Bowl. Like they, they have a lot of the pieces that you would want. And Derek, we appreciate you, yes, you know, man. spending Thank your you. time with us and, and joining the show. And before we get you out of here, I like asking all of the guests we have on, like, what is your – Dan Campbell is kind of the face of the franchise at this point. Like, he is the guy over Amon Ross St. Brown, over Jared Goff, over Aiden Hutchinson, and he is known for his, his quirkiness, we'll, we'll say. What, what is your favorite Dan Campbellism? Like, the, the weirdest things that he does. I don't know about uh, like a thing he said necessarily. I want to say off the top, though, I do love Dan Campbell, even from the jump when we weren't sure he was going to be good. He just seemed his energy was awesome. You know, I forget where I heard this, but a, a long time ago, somebody said your your team takes on the personality of either your head coach or your quarterback. And it seemed immediately when they hired Dan Campbell, it was going to be the Dan Campbell personality taking on. I think it's been awesome. I still will probably ne- never get over what his coffee order was. Like, as someone, who even drinks, <laughs> as someone who drinks a lot of coffee, that's like an incomprehensible amount of caffeine that I don't know how any man gets through the day that way. So shout out to him and his heart for being able to handle that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love Dan Campbell, man. And then we also throw our, que- our, our guests a couple of weird questions, too. We, we didn't get to hit you with this one last time because it was via phone. But how many owls in a day would you have to see before you – you had to call someone. Things are getting a little bit too weird for you. Yeah. <laughs> How many owls in a day? Until you like started you know, thinking I, something's I think, wrong. Yeah. I'm thinking probably by the third one. Because you know, <laughs> one can be like, one can be like, ah, whatever. And then second, you're like, that's a little off. And then by three, you're like, I don't, I've never seen this in my life. So something is a, a miss here. You call your loved ones. Make sure everybody's yeah. okay. <laughs> Derek, man, you're killing it uh, from, from Bleach Report to 33rd team and now The Athletic. Uh, can you give our audience uh, everywhere they can find you and your content? Yeah, first of all, thank you guys for having me. I love being on the show. You guys are awesome. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at QB Class. That's class with a K. And then, yeah, I'm the second half of The Athletic Football Show. Thank yes, you so sir, much, man. Derek. Appreciate, Appreciate you. you joining us, man. Thank you. Congrats awesome. on your success, man. Keep killing it. Thank you. Dude, I, I'll say it every time, man. The, the athletic guys are just, they, they're Top different. They, they all know. The, ball knowers. They're ball knowers, man. They're the best in the game. The athletic guys, every time we have a guy from the athletic on, it's just top-notch stuff.